Hello and welcome to day 9 of Tiny Code Christmas. Today we're going to be exploring another classic demo scene effect, the Shade Bob. Let's take a look at the characteristics of the Shade Bob. Here you can see we have a square that is moving across the canvas and every time it encounters a pixel it essentially increments the value of that pixel's colour. Now I have set this with a custom palette that makes it look a bit better but I will now show you what this would look like with the default Sweetie 16 palette on tick 80. Depending on our aesthetic preferences, we can add a cap so that it stops when it gets to 15, as you'll see in this example here. We can also change up the palette in tick 80. And again, this is something that is fairly tick 80 specific, but we're gonna take a look at it in a bit more depth today. So if you're here for the Pico 8, you can skip ahead. So this is my basic setup for my shade bob. I've cleared the screen, I have set up a timer, and I'm calculating the X and Y coordinates of where I want my square to be. So I am basing the movement of this particular square off of the center point of the screen, and I am using a rotation similar to the one that we covered yesterday in day eight, but with the slight difference, um, and again, we covered it yesterday, that I'm getting the cosine of one angle or one circle and I'm getting the sign of a different one and what that does is it just varies the rate of both the sine and the cosine so if we take a look at it the sine still goes up and down in the sine motion the cosine still goes left to right in a cosine motion but they're out of step with each other so they don't draw a circle and since we're centering this around 68 and 120 so we'll be multiplying these by 110 and by 60 so that means that we'll be adding a maximum of plus or minus 110 to 120 meaning we'll leave the edges um, alone and we'll be adding a maximum of plus or minus 60 to 68 again giving us a bit of clearance at the top so the easy thing to do to test this out is just to draw a circle x y i give it a radius of five and a color of two and let's take a look at what this looks like so this is just a regular circle drawing and there is no particular um, ability built into Tick80 to do the additive drawing of a shade bob. So one thing I'm just going to do first is just change these to some different values. And for example, we can get a pattern like that. That repeats back over itself if we do two and three. If we change these to three and two, we get this kind of a pattern and again we can just put in some random bits and pieces to get us a different shade bob movement and if you wanted to vary these over time so that the angle wasn't always the exact same angle and that you weren't drawing over itself um, in the same patterns forever that would be a good potential add-on for your shade bob so your challenge today is that you have to make the additive drawing part. Now, I used a circle there as an example. Circle is going to be hard, so I'm going to show you how to draw a square manually. So we've used a circle. The circle is going to be difficult to do additively because we'd have to you know the equation of a circle and stuff like that. So we're just going to use a square. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to draw a square manually without using the rect function in tick 80. Hopefully you'll be able to take that to the next stage yourself with the additive part. So I'm going to start off and loop. I'm going to use I and J because I've already used X and Y. So minus 4 to 4. Um, for J equal minus 4 to 4. Do. End. End. And I'm going to draw these pixels. So the pixel for this one is going to be X. Um, and this will be X plus j and the pixel for this one will be y plus i and what we're doing is x is the location of the center point of our shade bob and then we're going from minus four to plus four around that on the x and y axis and let's take a look at this i forgot to specify the color and there we go That is our square. 
working its way around the screen. Now you, your challenge is to add the additive part to that yourself. And we are going to take a look at the peek and poke functions and we're going to take a look at how they work. So first thing we're, that we're going to do is we are going to poke the video RAM in TIC80. So starting at memory location zero, the VRAM for the TIC80 is laid out and we can, we can access the screen memory while using the poke function. So instead of using the PIX function to set a pixel, I can poke memory location zero with two. And if I run it, you'll see that I have set the zero memory location, which is X zero, Y zero to that color two. Now I've also set the next pixel to black. And that happens because when we're using the poke function, it will write eight bits. The colors in tick 80 are only four bits, uh, zero to 15. You only need four bits to represent the colors, uh, the color index in tick 80. So when we poke, we're poking eight full bits. Now I can specify four in the poke function like this. And now I can, let's say, move to pixel number one, number two, etc., And we'll see that it will only write four. We can, of course, use the poke four function instead. And that will save us one character when we want to work with the screen memory. Um, you can, of course, use shift operators and R things together to write the full eight bits of color, but it's easier to just use the poke four function specifically so that you're poking in four bits of memory. The memory addresses that we would have to access if we're using poke four are then essentially halved because instead of accessing memory location one, which is eight bits, memory location two, which is eight bits further on from that, memory location three, which is eight bits further on from that. Again, we're going up in four. So memory location one will be four bits from zero, two will be four bits from one. So in order to access a specific memory location, if you need to with poke four, you essentially have to double it because you're counting in fours instead of eights. So let's revisit our clear the screen function that we wrote back on day three. We use the PIX function to clear the screen. And now we're going to do the same, but we're going to use a for loop. We're going to use i equal to zero, three, two, six, three, nine, do. I'll add my end. And I am going to poke into memory address i, the color two. So now we've written some clear screen code that uses the poke function to set the pixel color of the screen instead of the pix function or instead of using the clear screen function. Now that's easy when the memory is laid out in a linear fashion, but what do we want to do if we need to visualize things with, let's say we want to use an X and Y loop. How do we organize the location? So, so let's replace this with two for loops, one for the Y and one for the X. So we have Y equals zero. 2135, we have x equals 0 to 239. And so to poke these particular values, it would be to, to map these x and y coordinates to the linear memory. It'll be x plus y multiplied by 240. And if we run that, everything is great. So whatever our X value is, we need to take our Y value and multiply it by 240 to get which particular line we're at. And then we use the X value to move it in to that location. Now we're using poke four. Let's say if we bring back in our little curve that we were working on earlier and just use an X and Y value to move something around. So bring it back to 120 multiplied by the cosine of t plus 110 and y equals 68 multiplied by the sine of t plus 60. This should give us a nice sine motion and I'm just going to type these out fully. So this should give us a nice motion. Let's see what happens. So what we're seeing here 
is one of the differences between the picks function and the poke function. So let's just comment this out and let's just go picks x, y, 2. And we get what we, have, we, we would expect. What is happening with poke? Why is it giving us this garbage instead of the nice smooth curve? And the answer is this here, mat.sign, mat.cos. The x value isn't too much of a problem because we're just adding x, but we're multiplying y. And the sine and the cosine are going to give us back numbers with decimal points. And when we take a number, even if it has a, a decimal point, point 0.1, and we multiply it by 240, that number is going to be way out. We need to make sure that our y value is floored. So that's just something to look out for. If you're getting a lot of random movement or garbage when you're working with the poke function, just make sure that your value that you're basing your calculations off is actually uh, an integer or at least a number that doesn't have any fractional decimals on it. So that's how you update the VRAM directly using poke. What we're going to take a look at now is setting the palette. So I am going to adjust this lovely code here and I am going to go back to um, i equal to 0, 0 to 3, 2, 6, 3, 9 and I am going to set i equal to i mod 240. That gives me this lovely gradient that I'm going to use for testing the palette. So the palette resides at this memory location and the palette is 16 RGB colors. So that is 16 24-bit RGB colors. And to set the palette, we usually use something like um, j equal to 0 to 47. And again, that's 16 by 3. 0 to, to 47 do and we will usually poke so poke in this instance is going to be something that is the full byte because we are working with RGB colors so I can set every single color here so 0x 3fco and let's say I want to make the most unoriginal tick 80 palette ever um, plus J and now I have set every single color in tick 80 to black so all 16 of them I have just wiped them out with zero and I can do the same here and set it to 255 and now every single palette every single color if I comment this out this is what you should be seeing but I've overwritten every single color with white great so one handy palette to know is just to multiply that by 5 and it gives us this nice black to white-ish kind of a shade. And we can trace what this is doing. So it's setting the first RGB color to uh, zero times five. The next one is one times which is five. And the second one is 10. So that RGB color is zero, five, 10. Not exactly black, but good enough and why are we multiplying it by 5? So 255 is the max value that we can use here. So if we multiply 47 by 5, we get a value that's close enough to 255 to give us that range of colors. So instead of the hexadecimal memory address for the palette as well, we can use 16320 and that will save us a character. The byte battle section on the sizecoding.org wiki, um, link in the description, has a range of different palettes that are ready to go and you just have to set them up with a for loop like this so for example i'm just going to pick a random color from the byte battle page a random palette and it has them all organized by the length that they take 
and if I run this you'll see that we get this nice blue palette but this first palette also from the size coding.org wiki is the basic black to white gradient that we saw already so just to demonstrate this a bit better that it is actually RGB components I'm actually going to poke one six three two zero um, plus zero and I'm gonna set that to 255 I'm gonna poke the same plus one with zero and I'm going to poke the same plus two with zero so 255 red zero green and zero blue and that's after I've set the palette up here initially from black to white so now I'm setting the first color in the palette to red and you can see now that that has been successful and you can set any RGB color that you want you can go into Microsoft Paint and pick out a nice color and copy it in here um, painstakingly line by line but you can see that the amount of characters that were after taken up here just to change that one color to red this is not optimal there are other ways you can do things and again check out that byte battle page on the size coding wiki so we're going to leave it there for today try and make use of these new functions in your shade bob today so let's take a look at our shade bob in pico 8. so the first thing that i've set up here is i have x and y coordinates for my motion so i'm centering it in the middle of the screen i'm adding to it a cosine value of the time divided by 3.4 multiplied by 60 time by 2.2 multiplied by 60 these are just numbers mess around with them to see what works and the whole idea here is that you're essentially taking the sine and cosine at different rates so you have different rates of the sine going up and down it will be different to the cosine going left to right it will still be a sine motion if you take it in isolation and the cosine will still be in a cosine motion in isolation when you add the two of them together you get a much more complex behavior than just a simple circle so i am going to plot this and you notice that i have a cls up here before my loop so the screen is cleared once and only once at the beginning and I'm going to set X Y I'm going to give it a radius of 3 and I'm going to give it a color of 2 and I'm going to run that and we can see that we have our circle in motion around the screen now the circle is just the easiest way to visualize this motion for now but what we need to talk about now is the actual shade part of the the shade bob where it actually does the additive blending where it takes the colors that are there underneath the object and essentially increases them by one now this is difficult to do with a circle so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how we might draw a square pixel by pixel individually because none of the built-in functions in pico 8 have this additive blending mode that would allow us to add the color on top of or to increase the color count by one at a certain pixel so we are going to have a for loop um, I'm going to use i and j for this because I've already used x and y minus 4 to 4 j equals minus 4 to 4 end end and all I have to do is use p set and that'll be x plus j and y plus i because again we want to center it based on the x and y coordinates and then we'll add the minus four to plus four in each direction and i need to set this a color i set it two and if i run this we now have a square that is in motion around our lovely screen the additive part is up to you though so you have to figure out how do i add this color on top of it